As it stands, I've currently covered both houses that represent the Adrestrian Empire and the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Therefore, all that remains is to evaluate those from the Leicester Alliance, correct? Well, this tender morsel still requires some time to cook because fuck me, they should have called this game Fire Emblem Time Sink. And thus, I've decided to shine the spotlight on those who work within the Church of Ceres, acting as mentors for the students and the voices of reason throughout the journey. Though I use that term loosely, given that the following can be summarized as dad jokes, cocktails, rare simps, and fish for brains, which I'm certain is the reason the Death Knight kidnapped her so easily. While I personally don't spend as much time with the seniors compared to the students, that doesn't prevent them from being some of the most complex, entertaining and relatable members of the congregation, as well as demonstrating firsthand why they're responsible for training the next generation of Foden's future. Even if they end up being the ones on the receiving end of an ass whooping. Ah, oh, crap! So join me everyone, as it's time to discover who within the monastery are the most pristine servants of Ceres both figuratively and spoilers quite literally, as I count down my top 9 Knights of Ceres. So before we get down to the nitty and gritty, allow me to iron out a few details, since if you want to be technical, there are only 4 Knights of Seros. Therefore, on this occasion, I'm pretty much going to include any playable characters that aren't assigned to any specific house from the very start of the game. And when judging each entry, I will take into consideration story relevance, support, and gameplay performance. But at the end of the day, this is all just my opinion, so feel free to disagree. A spoiler warning for those who have not played Silver Snow, though to be fair, you're not missing out on much. And before you ask, no, the DLC characters do not count for this list, since they'll be getting their own. And frankly, if I were to refer to Happy as a Knight of Seros, I probably wouldn't wake up the next morning. And with all that cleared up, let the lesson begin as I discern who among the faculty are the ideal candidates to help each house fulfill their destiny. Though now that I say it out loud, Crimson Flower might as well be the subtext for tragic irony. Cyril. Just Cyril. Big shock to no one, I'm sure, as from my experience interacting with fans and members of the community, opinions regarding free houses vary greatly on the subject of characters, music, story routes, classes, etc. But despite so much diversity, I've noticed that the majority claim Cyril to be the worst character in the game. Well, playable character, since no one can be more of a scumbag than Mercedes's adoptive father if they tried. I too am inclined to agree on both accounts, though I would not consider Cyril to be outright awful given his backstory and very understandable, even relatable way of thinking. Plus, despite not looking like much, he'll be a more than capable Knight of Seros given enough time and EXP, which is ideal for this Almyron considering he talks about Rhea as much as Faye mentions Arm. Christ, now that I think about it, having these two in the same room is on my own eight circle of hell! Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Arm. Rhea. Rhea. Arm. Contrary to the majority of Rhea's workforce, Cyril is but a wee Almyron lad. Employed as a servant within Garrick Mark after Rhea took him in, as up until then he lost both parents and was captured by House Gonorel. Cause God knows Hilda doesn't have enough people cleaning up after her. Ever since the Archbishop liberated him, Cyril has been eternally grateful, and has dedicated his entire being to helping Rhea. A noble sentiment indeed, but this mindset is unfortunately the boy's biggest blunder. Due to the vast assortment of his dialogue consisting of praising Rhea to high heaven, or wishing to simply get on with his work, making what I discern to be a pretty straightforward fledgling and actually rather dull. Now, to Cyril's credit, his attitude makes perfect sense given his situation. And heck, characters like Camilla and Farja suffer from similar mentalities, albeit to a lesser extent, and yet I adore them. But the lack of any real endearment and witching Cyril acts so banal among such an esteemed ensemble only accentuates my irritation. Doubly so since Catherine already acts as the head of Rhea's fan club. I'm guessing the Archbishop needs a simp for each ass cheek. Cyril's supports continue his tradition of talking about how much he loves Rhea or focusing on getting his work done, with bits and pieces about his life in Almira present but kept to a minimum given his disdain for his homeland. While I'd argue none of his interactions are outright bad, I felt many of them fail to either stand out and lack any real chemistry between both parties. That being said, I legitimately admire learning a good bit about Almirans and their treatment for Fodland while he's scolding Hilda, and their discussion does a good job as to expressing how people should not be judged based on cultural stereotypes, while through the likes of Sephith, Lysithia, Shamir, and Pet he demonstrates considerable character growth, and in my opinion are the best interactions he has to offer. It's just a shame that 70% of the time, Cyril is too busy doing chores to convey any charisma, though at the very least all the hard work will pay off in the end when he busts out a bow. Cyril's reputation extends to being commonly referred to as the Est of Free Houses, considering with investment he'll certainly make Shamir proud, though I personally feel the Est comparison is a bit problematic since you know, people actually like her. This orphaned Almyron can join as early as Chapter 5 on the Blue Lion or Golden Deer route, and starts with low bases at level 9, with Magic, Defense, Res and Charm being in the single digits, while the rest of his figures are barely above 10 barring HP, so on average just about everyone will be outperforming him. 
While his starting stats are minimal, Seal's growths allow him to catch up in no time, as thanks to his skill aptitude, they all get boosted by 20%, granting him a minimum maximum value ranging between 30 to 60%, with speed, skill, luck and HP being his best figures, and having sonic caps too, though leaning more towards a glass cannon. Additionally, Cyril conjugates with free combat arts, two prowess skills, and close counter, all the while excelling in lance, riding, flying, axe, and bows, with the latter being C plus and C rank respectively, though magic is a chore he actively avoids, which will certainly make his relationship with Isiphia difficult to say the least. Cyril can collect up to 5 exclusive combat arts, with Vengeance being a must-have given his high HP and low defense, Lance Jab running off his best stat, as well as Point Black Volley, which is essentially a nerfed Hunter's Volley, the same way the Black Knight is a nerfed Zelgius. Unfortunately, the young Almyron lacks both a crest and balling talent, and if you are playing the Silver Snow route, Cyril joins right before the time skip with Pathetic stat, and his only new perk being increased Bow Prowess and Lance Breaker, as if I needed another excuse to abandon Rare, because trust me, I have plenty! Outside of his growth, Cyril additionally excels at some of the best learning fields regarding physically focused classes. As Arrow related to the linemen such as Sniper and Bow Knight, I noticed to him a world of good, and they are the easiest to obtain. Axes are another excellent choice, allowing him to hit hard and fast as a warrior, but I highly recommend becoming a brigand for Deathblow, and by investing in flying, he can become a Wiverlord, and the rest is history. The Cavalier certification leading into Paladin, I discovered to make him very well rounded, and by extension, Great Knight is a possibility that will help with his bomb, but honestly, there's no need to lose sleep over it. With the remaining choices being just fine, but don't be surprised if he doesn't do exceptionally well. And it goes without saying, but there's not much point in focusing on magic, given his pathetic spell book, with the only exceptions being either Dark or Holy Knight, but only those two, as I evaluate every other option to be a waste of time in a game that already feels like it goes on forever. In the context of class skills, I would highly recommend focusing on giving Cyril attributes that increase his damage output, like the previously mentioned Death Blow, and harboring abilities that run off his dexterity such as Ages and Device, to help with his lack of integrity. Conversely, due to the elevated hit points, Defiant skills and likes of Wrath and Vantage, as well as Desperation, can be risky, but very effective boost to Cyril's clout, and I summarised this on Myron to be a fun unit to experiment with, however he starts weak and is unlikely to become a top tier trooper, therefore I would only recommend his deployment if you have need of replacement infantry in the early game. Being in last place is not something one wishes to be synonymous with, but Cyril can make peace with the fact that while on the whole I'd be hard pressed to say I legitimately like him, I can't bring myself to call him a bad character. Plus, putting up with this peasant often yields a powerful young squire that Rhea will be proud of. Though I doubt Catherine will appreciate seeing Cyril become the Archbishop's new favourite, especially if a fight between the two broke out, given how Catherine's got no qualms with regards to fighting dirty. Aloise Rangeld Given the nature of the profession, it's safe to assume that being a Knight of Seros requires the individual to be strong-willed, bold, fearless, down-to-earth, and take things very seriously. Especially given the fact that there seems to be an incident every month involving the church. I would ask what the problem is, but at this point, I thought the better question is what isn't the problem. Despite such a hectic and harsh lifestyle, our oh so upbeat uncle never ceases to crack a smile and do what he can to lighten the mood, even if half the time I wish I could rip out his vocal cords. In all fairness, it's not impossible for Aloise to be legitimately funny, and while much of his characters are some of such silliness, I do admire how he looks out for everyone, and even has his own demons to deal with. Plus, when the time for action calls, he'll knock the wind out of his foes better than any punchline he can come up with. Which doesn't surprise me given the awful puns this man has the audacity to utter, to the point where I'm surprised his peers haven't somehow snapped as a result of his shenanigans. If it were up to me, I would've banned it. <laughs> Technically speaking, Aloise is the first Knight of Seros that Byleth encounters, and claims to be the best friend of Captain Gerald, thus granting herself the title of Uncle. And oh boy, does he fit that description to a T. Aloise is always brimming with energy and joy, making light of every situation and rambling on so much you could beat Fireman and Four by the time he's done. And while I appreciate the optimism, Aloise to me feels a little overbearing and rather irritating at certain points. And because so much of his character is focused on trying to make people laugh, rarely do his interactions succeed in fleshing him out and thus make for a rather shallow soldier. Despite being associated with the sound of crickets, there's something undeniably wholesome about Aloise, given how much he tries to look out for Byleth and the others, with this facade as a joker sliding into his supports, with the majority of them revolving around on helping his peers with their troubles, the quality of which can range from charming to cringeworthy. And though I'm well aware that supports don't have to be deep to be good a la Annette, I find the majority of these conversations to be rather forgettable, barring the discovery that Bernadette is more comfortable around Aloise due to the parallels he has with her uncle, as well as admitting to Shamir that he suffers from the occasional bout of PTSD, and how she helps him to come to terms with it. Plus, learning more about Captain Gerald when conversing with Byleth is neat, and inspiring Leone with tales of the captain's accomplishments makes perfect sense. And I'll admit that Aloise does bring a much-needed lightheartedness to some 
such a dark narrative, despite adding to the body count once call to action. Alois may act like a buffoon, but there's no questioning his role as the Knight of Seros, as this dude hits like a truck and has enough bulk to function as a pseudo army unit, only with actual movement worth a damn. Alois is one of the last troopers to ally himself with the Professor at level 21, carrying with him a mixed bag of stats, as his HP and strength are incredible, along with solid defense and charm, with the rest being below average. His growth will keep him at the very least consistent, which extends to his caps, permitting Alois to be a strong soldier from the get-go, but possibly his best perk comes in the form of his huge assortment of abilities and combat arts, ranging from 3 prowess and 2 rally skills, weight minus 3, axe fair and axe crit. His credentials favor brawling, axes and armor, all the while avoiding reason and flying, and since he starts with a B and A rank in the former field, he can equip some of the best respective weapons right away, plus the ability to obtain 4 exclusive combat arts, but the man does lack both a crush and budding talent, accumulating into, from my perspective, more of a filler unit as opposed to long term placeholder, but definitely good all things considered. Since he starts as a warrior, I find very little incentive to backpedal to previous classes. With the exception being Brigand for Deathblow, and thanks to his preferred fields of study, Warmaster works as an excellent affiliation to obtain. And Great Knight isn't too bad either, though it may take a while to procure. Plus, though he doesn't like flying, Women Lord is a no-brainer. And if you are considering going Great Knight, then Paladin is a worthwhile substitute. Plus, Assassin and Swordmaster help to make up for his low speed while complementing his already excellent attack. Of course, Magic isn't doing him any favors given that he won't see to reason and has a poor spell pool. However, thanks to Faith being neutral and having high brawling, Warmog I consider to be your best bet. And truthfully, any mixed build that requires Faith, like Holy Knight and Trickster, aren't the worst thing to happen to Free Houses since Chapter 6 of the Ashen Wolves. Free bolting uses in range of the spawn with no stride in sight? Are you fucking kidding me? What I feel is most important regarding Aloise's employment revolves around the skills he can sustain, as through Warmaster, the ability Quick Repose makes up for his lack of speed on enemy phase, and the likes of Deathblow speak for itself. Having such high HP acquiesces the corresponding abilities to be reliably activated, in particular the Defiant skills and Wrath, as well as Vantage for a surprise critical hit. Also, while the likes of Aegis and Provice sound promising, his lack of dexterity denounces their utility, but it's easy to see why Alois has been employed for so long. Though on a personal note, I feel within the context of Azura Moon, he's rather redundant given that Dudu and Gilbert exist. Uncle Eloise may come off as a glass half empty, but what substance he does sustain makes him undeniably charming and nonetheless splendid to share a drink with. Though I would not be surprised if Geralt drank so much in order to stomach all of his awful jokes. Christ, it's a good thing Rhea did the blood transfusion beforehand, otherwise he would have died of alcohol poisoning long before Kronia finished what his liver started. <laughs> Gilbert Eddie Dominique I am taking a few liberties with this entry, as Gilbert is technically a Blue Lions exclusive character come time skip. Given his role in the grand scheme of things, I feel it's only fitting to include him among the fellow patrons, though I'm sure he would protest at any sort of acceptance, as Gilbert is one of the most self-deprecating and loathing characters in the game where both Marianne and Bernadetta exist. Oh sweet Jesus, someone give these honeys a hug already! Such perplexing skepticism stems from his backstory and relationships that make Gilbert equal parts fascinating as he is frustrating, though at the very least his thick skin and stoicism complement his dedication to protecting the crown prince. At least until Dudu finds his way back to his highness, guess Gilbert didn't get the memo that his contract was temporary. The masses within Garrick Mark have been battling their own demons long before Byleth ever set foot into the institution, Gustav in particular having abandoned his title and family after failing to protect the king during the tragedy of Duska, who spends most of his time moping and avoiding all contact with his daughter at every turn, much to Annette's frustration. As a matter of fact, despite his excellent backstory, frustration is how I would aptly describe Gilbert, as many of his closest friends and family are continually encouraging him to forgive himself and only wish to rekindle the relationship they once had, yet Gilbert refuses to budge at every turn and witnessing this discredited dolt continually shoot down any chance of redemption feels rather forced and contrived. Christ, imagine if he had this attitude towards his work ethic. Mr. Weed, I can't come to work today. I was in a terrible plane crash. My entire family was killed and I am a vegetable. I'll see you tomorrow. As irritating as Gilbert's pessimism may be, I can't deny that it supports us something to behold. Showcasing Gilbert's stance in helping the students become the best that they can, while also stressing the reality of knighthood and the difficult life they have ahead of them. Additionally, many of his comrades helped to reinvigorate a part of his life he had once forgotten. Whether it be sharing a similar predicament with Dudu and bonding over their loyalty to the prince, having Manuela sing and bring a smile to his face and reassure this siren that her voice remains unparalleled, recollecting the past with Cassandra and focusing on how they must fight for the future, and despite his indifferent aura, Annette discovers that he never once stopped loving her. All of these confessions congregate into a character that I find to be continually compelling but the lack of any real closure makes the majority of his character arc ultimately disappointing, though he never once let me down when it comes to protecting his highness. 
Gilbert may have abandoned his integrity, but the man's skills remain unscathed, as though for many he's considered a temporary to do, there's nothing wrong with being a replacement for the dreaded Duskin. Gilbert can technically be deployed as an NPC during Chapter 5, but he officially becomes a party member once Azura Moon initiates, where he fittingly functions as a level 26 Fortress Knight with bases that reflect his position, as his HP, Strength and Defense are fantastic, Skill and Charm are okay, while the rest are a real piece of piss, speed specifically, with growths that are relatively good barring res, luck and magic, plus max stats that aren't winning any awards with the exception of HP. If we observe Gilbert in regards to purely numerics, I feel he's better suited to short term use considering the difficulties armor units face towards the end game, but few compared to Annette's disgraced daddy regarding pure bulk and power. Thankfully, Gilbert has been granted free class and prowess skills, rare defense, and his own personal ability that results in minus two damage when equipped with a gambit. The man comes bearing free combat art and just as many exclusive attacks, Glowing Ember in particular being exceptional given his monstrous defense, while simultaneously excelling in lance, axe, armor and riding plus no negative accolades. Thanks to this, not only is it easy to unlock some of Gilbert's preferred classes, but I would highly recommend S-ranking both weapons in order to get crit plus 10 for each, and on the subject of classes, Great Knight is pretty much made for him as it offsets his lack of mobility, as well as granting both Lance and Axe fair. In fact, pretty much all classes that favour Lance and or Axe are the way to go, therefore backtracking to Brigand or Knight for death and armoured blow can boost his best stats, all the while Warrior and Warmaster could turn him into a raging monster. For those wishing to balance his build, Paladin makes for an interesting prospect. Although it may take a while, Wyvern Lord Gilbert can make him scarier than Annette with a bolt axe. Plus, I recommend going down the grapple line in order to take down this foes after one round of fisticuffs. While classes remain, I summarize to be adequate options. But unlike his offspring, the arcane arts are not a subject that Gilbert is well versed in despite being able to learn Thoron. However, Dark or Holy Knight are perfectly reasonable preferences. Since Gilbert's stats are so polarizing, the skills that I recommend are the ones that boost his best numbers. However, the likes of Tonebreaker, Quick Propost, Warding Blow, Rule of Void, Life Taker, Aegis or Pervice can aid in negating his biggest setbacks, and because he's so slow, getting still defense can make life much easier for the remaining warriors. In accordance with his replacement skills that require HP activation, such as Wrath, Vantage, the Defiant skills and so on, are good choices but be wary of enemies packing magic. And while a bit rigid in regards to occupation and outright infuriating in his stubbornness, this gentleman's guff is not to be overlooked and I can partially commiserate his plight, and appreciate just how personal and professional his relations are. Yet despite being absent throughout the majority of Annette's life, he still managed Manages to be one of the better Fire Emblem dads. Christ, this is gonna make for an interesting episode of Jerry Springer. What are you, some kind of freak? Hey, shut up. Okay, okay, come on. I'll kick you. Bring it on, you stinky. It's okay, Spike. You mother. Hanneman von Esser. By far the most appropriately dressed for the occupation, Professor Hanneman alongside Byleth, Manuela and Juritsa are responsible for teaching the students on a regular basis, and given both his age and experience, it's fair to say he's the ideal man for the job, especially since despite suffering from a bad case of crustacean, I found him to be one of the wisest and most endearing adults who always does his best to aid others and interpret events from various points of view. Plus he's certainly gifted in the magical arts despite his seniority, acting as his biggest crutch regarding the other stats, and oh boy am I glad Garrick Mark didn't go through a pandemic, as I can't imagine how trying to teach online would pan out for him. Good morning, students of the Golden Deer House. I trust that you are all well and staying safe in these troubled times. Anyway, for today's lesson, we shall be... Hold a minute, please. Claude, why are you on Twitter right now? Oh, my apologies, sir. I'm just going through Edelgard's tweets and seeing if I can dig up any dirt on her. Oh, what's this about the Flame Emperor? Anyway, getting back on track today, we shall explore the origins of... Raphael, are you browsing through Uber Eats? What? I'm hungry. It's been 10 minutes since I last ate. <sighs> Honestly, Raph, if you keep this up, you're gonna get fat, and you'll be of use to no one if you can't fight. Actually, while you're there, order me some cake, will ya? Lysithia, please don't encourage him. And Ignatz, refrain yourself from browsing for fan art on Google. Now is not the... Hilda, are you... Are you live streaming right now? So basically, we're going to have a new monthly giveaway for everyone that donates 10 gift subs or more. And I've got a brand new video up on my OnlyFans page, so if you haven't already signed up, I would totally love it if you did. Oh, and don't forget to follow my Instagram as well! <laughs> Dear me, I hope the professor is having an easier time with the Black Eagles. Oh.
My god, Ferdinand, will you shut up about the fact that you have more subs than me? Never! This is proof of my stature as a noble and that I am superior to you. My goodness, does your idiocy know no bounds, you insufferable moron? You stay out of this, Hubert. I don't need you to fight my battles. Ugh, why are we wasting so much time with these petty squabbles? Christ, you nobles are just the worst! Oh no, I knew it! Dorothea, you actually hate me! Father was right, nobles and commoners can never mix! <laughs> Damn it, Bernadetta! Stop jumping to conclusions! Don't yell at Bernie, you asshats! Yeah, Ferdinand! It's your fault we're even arguing in the first place, dickhead! Loud noises! Loud noises! I'm already too old for this shit. Being one of the oldest members of Garrick Mark, Hanneman has quite the long and fascinating history, quickly establishing his role as a Crest Scholar and was in fact the driving force behind Crestology research for Alfoglan during his youth, being enamoured by them and wanting to learn everything there is about these mysterious markings. Whenever Hanneman has the chance to converse with others, he often makes Crest the initial topic of discussion or finds some way to feed the subject into his exchanges, resulting in rather poor first impressions on my end as he came off as rather boring given the monotony of the subject matter. However, much to my surprise, Hanneman himself is aware of this and often tries to be far more personal with his peers, actively listening to their woes and offering what assistance he can. Plus, despite his devotion to Cress, Hanneman's sister had the unfortunate fate of being forced to bear Cress babies until her untimely death, causing Mr. Von Esser to make it his goal for everyone to have Cress should they choose to, as to avoid her grim fate. Bearing witness to Cress roles in society, I find it very admirable that Hanneman still sees the best in these blasted things and tries to aid others in embracing the gifts that they bear, much of which is expressed through his supports, as while many of them start off rocky to say the least, by the end Hanneman helps to reassure those with these cursed bloodlines that Crests are a part of who they are, allowing Marianne and Lysiphia to put their minds at ease, as well as discover the nature behind Byleth's backstory. While that's all well and good, I feel that Hanneman is at his best when acting as a voice of reason, as he always looks at both sides of the situation and encourages his underlings to consider a different perspective, such as having Hubert perceive his father in a different light, sympathising with Dorothea's plight and showcasing that it's not just the poor who hate the nobility, and agreeing with Edelgard's ambition to remove the importance of Crest throughout society, but offering up different methods as to doing so, as well as bunning heads with Manuela on every occasion, despite the fact that these two are practically made for each other, and I cannot begin to imagine how they're going to handle Valentine's Day. Admit it! You're disgusted by me. No, you're disgusted by me. I'm as attracted to you as I've ever been. Prove it! <laughs> Unfortunately, Hanneman is better suited to explaining the fundamentals of fighting rather than a practical demonstration, as his body simply isn't what it used to be. In accordance with his fabulously fashionable counterpart, Hanneman can join Byleth by Chapter 8, and upon inspection, his stats regarding magic and res are very impressive with everything else being eh, while defense, luck and speed are barely above the pupil's bases. His growths follow a similar format, though Dex is actually pretty solid. However, it's unfortunate that most of his caps are lacking, so he'll hit hard with magic and is rather resilient to the stuff. But that's about it. Thankfully, all is not lost, as Hanneman logs in with three prowess skills, close counter, and his personal ability rally magic, not to mention two bow-based combat arts and the chance to learn Ward Arrow at A rank, along with his own minor crest of Indec, permitting him an additional follow-up attack, but at this point, I've had better luck trying to make Walt good than cause crest activation. What I feel to be Hanneman's claim to fame is his spell pool, starting at a B rank in Reason, with access to Fire, Wind, Sagittae and Thoron, which can be expanded to acquire the likes of Meteor, though his faith field is just okay and is not a bad choice for the magic bow all things considered, along with a good understanding as to how to ride a horse, even if armor and flying are too much of a millennial thing for this old coot. To be perfectly honest, I evaluate Hanneman to act as more of a niche pick, as he only tends to deal serious chip damage and slightly support his allies, but isn't exactly winning any wars when it comes to healing or utility, making a large assortment of arcane based associates a superior investment. And physically speaking, there's little to no use for him, so I hope he's got a solid pension plan. Hanneman manifests as a mage, and just about every class that focuses on reason should be his ultimate goal, with Dark Knight being an admirable association and Warlock granting him additional meteor munitions, plus Dark Mage for Poison Strike, but it is such a shame that Gremory, Dark Flyer, and Valkyrie are female exclusive, the same way the ladies can't become heroes, war masters, and dark mages. Man, some of these gender lock classes make less sense than Seneca's decision to join Jedi, which is somehow even stupider than the entirety of Conquest. God, you're an idiot.
When magic isn't an option, going either sniper or bow knight are the ideal substitutes. Since Hanuman can deal a lot of damage with the magic bow, and Hunter's Volley makes up for his lack of speed tenfold. Aside from that, I did discover that Hanuman can be effective as War Master when battering in the Aura Knuckles. Not to mention Quick Repose, plus Paladin is always a safe choice. And thanks to the likes of Levin Sword and Bolt Axe, you can at the very least make use of those classes with the corresponding fair skills, in order to give Hanuman that extra punch. When claiming the Exemplar Mastery skills, the previously mentioned Quick Propose, and the always essential Death Slash Fiendish Blow are a given, in addition to the fair skills for extra damage, and Bro Breaker to ensure he won't meet an early grave. Seal Defense and Red can help his allies, given Hanuman's chances to one round the enemy! Plus, Brawl the Void is a good choice for those who wish to wield the Aura Knuckles. Also, going Archer for hit plus 20 can help to ensure that his siege attacks never miss their target, but on the whole, Hanuman, while proficient, is extremely limited in what he brings to the table, and despite his fascination with crests, this old dog has enough history to relate with and help others look at life in new and often enlightening ways. Though, given the rowdy nature of Garrick Mott's graduates, I'm surprised he was able to avoid having a heart attack. So oh, I guess you're in okay shape, huh? No heart problems or anything. Will I? Boo! Oh, yeah. you, oh, you, 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 oh. I'm okay. <laughs> Catherine Rubens Karen. Fire Emblem has never held back in regards to badass female characters, and Free Houses continues this tradition with the likes of Edelgard, Ingrid, Leone, Shamir, Constance, Seros. Petra, and the tenacious Thunder Catherine, a woman so cool and powerful, she's probably got the biggest set of balls in all of Fogland, plus combined with her hero's relic, gives new meaning to the phrase big dick energy. Innuendos aside, Catherine is one of the most kick-ass women in Fire Emblem with plenty of depth to boot, and the type of person who's a lot of fun to be around, until she starts getting political, and quickly becomes someone I wouldn't touch with a 50 foot pole, though that's also because doing so will ensure my demise, as that hero's relic isn't for show, and no wonder as why Crimson Flower is considered the hardest route in the game. Heck, she should have been the final boss, as it would have made for a showdown Star Wars would be proud of. <laughs> the fabled Thunder Catherine doesn't make herself known to Byleth until Chapter 3, where the students are tasked with taking down Lord Donato, and it's here where we learn firsthand that you don't fuck with Catherine, Catherine fucks you. This champion of the church is cool, confident, easygoing, and pretty damn upbeat, making her a very fun person to be around, and she's the type of best friend to buy everyone a round of drinks just for the fuck of it, provided she actually has the money. Despite such a laid-back demeanor, when things get serious, Catherine is a true professional, demonstrating exceptional conduct during missions and always on point when instructing the students. But even someone as magnificent as this mercenary still has red in her ledger. Catherine may be an esteemed knight of Ceres, but to get to that point, she not only abandoned her homeland after being implicated in the plot to kill the king, but she also turned over her best friend and Ash's brother Kristoff for execution. And yet somehow these two can get married by the end. I know that Ash has a hard on for knights, but this is regard damn ridiculous. Cassandra is fiercely loyal to Rhea, and will cut down just about anyone who so much as frowns at the Archbishop, being dangerously deluded in her beliefs, and someone I find difficult to trust. It also doesn't help that she occasionally falls into the same camp as Cyril, where she doesn't seem to shut up about the Archbishop, and goes to show how too much simping shall lead to suffering. Throughout her support, I witness just about every side there is to Catherine, helping instruct the lives of Ingrid and Leone to become the best soldiers they can, bringing Lorenz, Caspar and Linhart back down to earth regarding the reality of their ambitions, delving into her past with Ash, the Prince and Gustav, as well as some damn good banter with Shamir and Sephith. So while dangerous at her worst, Catherine is an absolute bombshell of a babe, though given my aversion to the church, I don't think a support between us would go very well. Look, Catherine, I'm not saying the church is completely in the wrong. They've done plenty of good, but you can't deny that Edelgard has a point. Even Claude is of a similar mindset. Oh please, they're just a bunch of kids who don't know any better. If it were up to me, I would have snuffed out that little emperor straight away! See, this is the kind of thought process that has caused Fogland to fall to ruin. Whenever someone does something Rhea doesn't like, she just gets rid of her or act like it doesn't exist. I mean, even Seth has tried to call her out on occasion. You're wrong about Rhea! She's perfect and has brought nothing but joy to Fogland! Anyone who thinks otherwise is a fool, and as far as I'm concerned, they don't even deserve to be with the goddess after death! Check, please. I may not see eye to eye with Catherine regarding politics, but I will never question her battle prowess, as this leading lady can cut through an entire army like they're made of paper, and start so strong, I'm surprised the enemy didn't just drop dead at the sight of her stats. 
Speaking of which, Cassandra can enlist as early as Chapter 4, as the first member of the church to aid the team, and yet she pertains some of the best bases, having almost 20 speed and strength, with good HP, dex and defense too, however magic and charm are fleeting. Heck, even during Silver Snow, where she's pushed back to Chapter 11, her bases are boosted to compensate and be in the upper 20s, so don't ever scrutinize this Swordmaster. Catherine's growths assist her offensive capabilities, as HP, speed and strength are 50% and above, with dex not far behind. However, everything else leads towards the lower end of the spectrum, and she'll pretty much be a glass cannon to the extreme once all capped out. As if having excellent bases wasn't enough, Cassandra contains four combat arts, the Hero's Relic Thunderbrand, and the corresponding Major Crest of Karen, along with learning two exclusive fist attacks paired with an A-ranking sword, Brawling being at C level and a D in authority, excelling in the former two fields with Reason being her only setback, plus a pretty meh spell pool minus Ragnarok and no budding talent. Her personal skill grants additional bulk when disregarding a battalion, which is useful but rather risky towards the second half of the game where they become otherwise essential. And thankfully, many of her best abilities are already available. Debuting as a sword master with both sword fair and sword crit, along with axe breaker, plus free prowess skills. And by investing in brawling, Bombard could be obtained at A rank. And with that not so subtle segue, classes that complement Catherine are primarily sword based. So the likes of Assassin and Trickstar are pretty good for some additional utility. With Warcleric being okay as well, but Mortal Servant I claim to not be worth the effort given that she fails to listen to reason. And honestly, just about any physical class is commendable, with some obvious picks being Riven Lord and Paladin. However, focusing on both has significant merit as she can gain close counter as well as hit plus 20, which complements Thunderbrand due to its low accuracy. Plus, bearing in mind her fragility, the armor class line could beef up her bulk, but I'd only recommend that if you're willing to guard. On a great night by the end. Magic classes I'd argue to be about as worthless as Radiant Dawn supports, with the only benefit being certain skills, but even then that's pushing it. Speaking of which, the ones I figure to pique Catherine's interest primarily revolve around increasing her offense by going either Pegasus Knight or Brigand for darting and or death flow. Though it's certainly possible to try and offset her weaknesses with the likes of Aegis and Provice, and personally speaking one very interesting strategy is mastering Valkyrie in order to unlock Uncanny Blow, which increases her hit by 30 if she initiates, making Thunderbrand her permanent BFF. At this point, it's no surprise why Catherine is both a friend to revere and an enemy to admire, as the aura she accentuates is otherwise unparalleled, as well as acting as one of the strongest soldiers of Seros. And if Free Houses were any more anime, I get the feeling Catherine's entrance would have gone something like this. Thunder. 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 Thunder Brand. Oh! Flame. This should surprise no one as I've made it no secret as to how much I am a sucker for adorableness and Fire Emblem has no shortage of characters I want to cuddle, though in the case of Flame, I'm not sure Sephiroth would allow it. Her charm is more than skin deep however, as Flame walks a very thin line between being a sophisticated woman and a fish crazed toddler, as one minute she could be talking about the pain of losing those you love and how you must hold on to the memories you cherish. And at the drop of a hat, she'll get hungry from the smell of oil and demand but the freshest of fish. Christ, I hope Folder never goes for a drought. Despite flip-flopping between these two extremes like, well, a fish, Flame is always so endearing and sweet to indulge, but it's a shame that she doesn't fare well outside of her fish tank, with only a few classes casting her as the catch of the day. I guess the phrase sink or swim is the most appropriate way to summarise this fledgling. This little bundle of fluff is known to the public as Seth's little sister, though she is featured rather infrequently, until her kidnapping and subsequent rescue, at which point she convinced her vigilant father to let her join the professor's class. Oh yeah, Sephiroth is actually her dad, much to no one's surprise. What is surprising is that not only is she of a similar race to Rhea, but is in fact Saint Sephiroth who fought in the War of Heroes many eons ago, where she sustained serious injuries and lost her mother during that fated battle, explaining as to why Sephiroth is so protective. Due to the majority of her life spent in quarantine, Flame is a very wide-eyed and curious girl, as she is fascinated by just about everything and has a childlike innocence that's just downright adorable, almost as if Nino and Florina became one and adopted the love for marine life. Flame provides such a warm and wholesome atmosphere whenever she is present. Plus, though her lockdown lifestyle made her extremely naive, she displays wisdom far beyond her years and is able to soothe even the most tortured of souls. In fact, she's so cute, I'm sure that's what saved her when the Death Knight took her hostage. Oh! Hey, what about this little plant? Can I smash it with a rock? No, Chef. It's too adorable to kill. When conversing with her classmates, I find Flame's supports to vary greatly between being captivating and childish, as her conversations with Sylvain, Dudu, Raphael and Linhart, while very sweet, are more so played for laughs, whereas the likes of Dimitri, 
Felix, Ignax, and Byleth show that Cephalene is smarter than she looks and ends up imperating their own revelations. Though as much as I find her adorable, I can't help but be bothered by how jarring and downright stupid her topics of discussion can amount to. But when you've been isolated for so long, it's little surprise that certain social skills will be lacking, and unfortunately these setbacks hold true when she's tasked with carrying out missions. Flame may have fought alongside Ceres in the War of Heroes, but I am not the least bit surprised that she had to heal after all was said and done. As to my knowledge, Cephalene is unfortunately one of the worst magic units in the game, though thankfully the DLC has moved her up a few ranks. Flame joins the Professor's house by the end of Chapter 6, and upon her enrollment, she's a level 11 priest with some very polarizing stats, as her magic, res and charm are impressive, but everything else is barely above the student's bases minus dex, which is actually okay. These lopsided numbers will only grow farther apart, as she has strong growth and caps in her higher values, while everything else might as well not exist. Granting Flame the ability to deal some strong magical burst damage, become the best magic tank in Vogtland, and a good Gambit user, one of the worst units physically speaking, and lacking an overall offense. Mercifully, Flame has a few additional perks such as two prowess skills, and the power to reduce the damage her allies receive, plus a C plus rank in Faith, granting her access to three of her five white magic spells, with the remaining two being Rescue, and more importantly, Fortify. Not to mention her Lance rank is also C+, with the chance to learn two exclusive arts, while simultaneously favouring both fields, but avoiding armour and riding at all costs. Flame simultaneously shares the same crest as Linhart, as well as a budding talent in Reason which grants her seal magic, and very luck is a thing as well. Flame naturally favours magic, but more so in regards to support, and as such, faith focused professions are the ideal acquisition, with Bishop being the obvious choice, however I must stress that Reason should not be ignored, as Gremory complements both types of magic and Warlock is useful for gaining Bowbreaker, plus by completing her parallel she gains access to a staff that increases her magical range for easier engagement. Now before the DLC came out, the only classes I would recommend at the time were Dark and preferably Holy Knight, but the Ashen Wolves gifted this as the one with the Dark Flyer class, that not only complements her best feels but rewards her for engaging magic users with Transmute, and is thus a fantastic pick. Trickster and Warclerk aren't too bad either if you have the Aura Knuckles on standby for the latter, plus Valkyrie is certainly useful, and as a dancer, Flame fulfills her role as a support unit extremely well, so be sure to drag her away from the dining hall in order to participate in the Heron Cup. When casting magic to the side, due to Lance and Flying being her preference, Pegasus slash Falconite is easy enough to attain, and should Flame follow in her father's footsteps, becoming a Wyvern Lord should result in a solid mixed defense build. Unfortunately, the remaining Lance based classes favor riding, which is counterproductive, and Great Knight is a bigger pipe dream than the new F Zero game at this point, and I discern every other melee class to be insufficient unless you require the appropriate arcane weapons. Skills I feel Flame would appreciate are ideally focused around magic that increase either her damage or utility, like Fiendish and Darting Blow, plus Transmute in order to grant this girl a much needed buff, and aside from that, anything to offset her low physical stats is a good shout. Flame, despite her utility and terrific magical bulk, can't do much in terms of actual damage, and starts rather weak to boot. However, well, given the correct correlation, Cephalene should shine, and though rather wishy-washy when deciding on her diction, Flame is undeniably dazzling, whom I shall do everything in my power to protect, and make sure that even in Crimson Flower, she gets the best ending possible. Though to be honest, all Ray had to do was convince Flame that Elgard had stolen all the sea life, and she'd have taken on the entire empire herself. After all, getting between Flame and a fish is scarier than the Death Knight will ever be. Well, you know what? I would love some chocolate. Here you go. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah. He's okay. Manuela Casagranda. And here we have yet another professor to look after the students and set an example for them. But if her behavior is any evidence, she's the one who needs to be taken care of, since my mother is, putting it lightly, a bit of a mess. In spite of taking the notion of MILF status to a whole new level, this songstress continually has trouble with love and often drinks away her sorrows on a daily basis, resulting in a slobbering mess who's quick to anger and often makes situations worse than they need to be. Talk about a literal drama queen. Manuela is commonly portrayed as a bit of a joke, but whenever showcased at her peak, this divine diva lives up to her reputation, as her voice, wisdom, and serenity make her one of the most awe-inspiring characters on the continent, as well as helping to ameliorate her fellow performers on a professional and personal level. Plus, keeping them safe is no problem, as she's probably the most equitable unit in Fogland, and someone who I feel has slept on considerably, which is ironic because she's rarely ever actually slept on. And at the time of this recording, I'm surprised she's not in Fire Emblem Heroes, as this game will never say no to someone who has sex appeal. <laughs>
Anyone who's played Three Houses for more than a few hours knows how much of a loose cannon Manuela can be, as at first, while a bit ostentatious and flirty, she's about what you'd expect from a member of the monastery, but as time progresses, so does Manuela's bad habits, ranging from drinking too often, having the students help to reorganize her, running headfirst into danger, death and I'd be damned, butting heads with Hanuman so frequently I'm surprised they're still both standing, and just being an all-around embarrassment and bringing into question the standards Garrick Mark holds dear, if they had any to begin with. Despite being up to shambles more often than not, I find Manuela's story to be one of the most fascinating in Free Houses, as she discovered her gifted voice during a trip to the monastery, which cemented her love for the goddess, and thus used said talents to become the star of the Middle Frank Opera Company. Over the years, she found Dorothea and taught her in the ways of the theatre, and at the height of her popularity, retired to become a teacher and physician, demonstrating that Manuela has done more in supposedly three decades than others do in their entire lifetime. And yet, somehow, she can't find a partner to settle downward despite her appearance and accolades. Maybe she has trouble dropping the whole teacher facade when she's on a date. You boys have been very naughty. I'm gonna have to assign you extra homework. Darn it, fractions are so hard. What'd you get for number four? She said, don't share answers! Whenever someone has the pleasure or misfortune of Manuela's present, her supports emphasize her best and worst traits, primarily the former. As both Sylvain and Cyril have to tend to Manuela after a night of rum and regret, Hanneman goes back and forth from loving and hating his co-worker, she uses Byleth as a source of venting, and Zevith gives her an earful about her behavior. At the same time, both parties reveal more about their backstory and even hint at the possibility of a future together. She educates Flane about her life in the opera and the harshness behind her heroism, helps Lorenz embrace his love for poetry through her singing, aids Alois in finding a suitable gift for his daughter, discovers that she was the one who inspired Ferdinand to become the man he is today, reminiscing about the good old days with Dorothea and where their lives could go if they stick together, and even explaining to Edelgard her need to build a life outside of the theatre and how the goddess is the one who gives her strength regardless of how the church acts. Thanks to this, I can both laugh at and lord Manuela, given how much she helps others as well as dealing with her own insecurities. That results in a surprisingly deep diva, but it's good to know that she'll always deliver a riveting performance when her stage is a battlefield. Given what Dorothea went through as a performer, it's no surprise that Manuela's got more than enough experience at handling both swords and spells, as she migrates at the same time and level as Hanuman, only as a priest with all of her stats minus defense, in the double digits and within very close range of each other. This results in Manuela being a very balanced unit, though one not particularly potent, doesn't have any major drawbacks, factors which extend to her percentages, as she possesses the highest speed growth in the game aside from Yuri, and all of her other values average at around the 40% margin. Plus, once she's capped her curriculum, they'll also be pretty consistent, if somewhat low. Thankfully, stats aren't the be all end all, as she starts with a B rank in Faith, along with C plus in Swords and D in Flying, granting her access to four of her Faith spells, along with her only exclusive but nonetheless exceptional art, Hexblade. Plus, when adjacent to her patients, she offers plus 10 Critical Avoid and Rally Charm to boot. Manuela excels in all of the above fields, but much like her relationships, she has no luck with a budding talent or crest, and is lacking in regards to both armor and unfortunately reason, and that's a big shame since she learns bolting at A rank. So even though it is a bitch to unlock, I highly recommend sticking it through. And of course, maxing out faith grants my mother war. For many players, Bishop seems like the best route to go down, with Grimory maximizing both spell sources, and thus I claim it to be a fantastic choice. However, the likes of Holy Knight, Dark Flyer, and Valkyrie are also viable options. Plus, tricks to a war cleric, but just to be safe, be sure to sign in as the mace so that she can obtain Fiendish Blow. It is unfortunate that Manuela is unable to obtain the White Heron Cup, as she would have made for a fantastic dancer. But that doesn't stop her from having considerable versatility, as when pursuing a purely physical route, sword classes are the easiest choice. Complementing her agility with Swordmaster granting her extra crit, and Assassin being her preference were she to become the enemy! And since she's well versed in flying, the Pegasus and Falcon Knight class sign is an impressive coalition. Within Law 2, though, it will take a few semesters to secure. The remaining vocations I'd remark to be okay, but the armor affiliation, despite aiding her bulk, is in my opinion best avoided, and for the most part, skills are another case of being fine regardless of pick. But it goes about saying that magic based ones are your best options. Darting plus the remaining blow and fair skills have their perks, and when factoring in her speed, desperation can make for a nasty surprise with the general consensus being that Manuela is more of a support unit given her abilities, and in my opinion is one of the most reliable members of the team that can work in just about any scenario. But don't be surprised she's unable to keep up with the young blood of Garrick Mark, which I find fitting as while Manuela's behaviour has the consistency of Binding Blades RNG, she uses her knowledge and experience to help the youngs become the brightest stars on the stage, and keep them safe when fighting for the future. Though I'm surprised that at no point during the game did Manuela happen to have a hangover when being deployed. It would have made for a hilarious start to the battle. Mine. Seth. 
Overseeing Fodland and being the head of the Church of Seros is no easy task, and naturally Rhea is going to need some help, primarily because she sucks at her job. Thankfully, Sephiroth is more than capable of picking up the slack, as while he too clings strongly to his beliefs and isn't exactly the most chilled when it comes to the subject of Flane, this man's wisdom is truly magnificent, as no matter who he converses with, the experience is enlightening for both parties, and while partially responsible for Fodlin's state of being, he sees and has been at the mercy of its flaws, making him a mentor figure that I feel has much more sentimental significance and should have been the one in charge from the start. Doubly so, since despite being one of the last units to side with Byleth, Sephiroth manages to function as one of the greatest in the game, to the point where I'm glad he can't transform, otherwise Elrogod would have no chance of overthrowing the church, and cut Crimson Flower shorter than it already is. Since I already spoiled Sephiroth's true identity when discussing his daughter, Chico has been overseeing Foden alongside Seros for centuries, and after the death of his wife and almost losing Flane, Sephiroth has been protected to a fault, and shows considerable scepticism towards just about everyone, Byleth in particular given the unknown circumstances of their birth and sudden administration into the monastery, because thanks to Rhea, qualifications don't mean shit if favouritism is a factor. During the early stages of Free Houses, Sephiroth did initially rub me the wrong way. Given that every interaction felt like an interrogation, but one rescued daughter later, Sephiroth loosens up and demonstrates that despite being rather uptight, he's a recipient of reason, always doing what he feels are in the best interests of everyone and keen to take all variables into account. Even when facing off as an enemy, he prioritizes his daughter's safety before his ideals and has himself suffered because of crests, epitomizing integrity and being someone I greatly admire. Heck, before the time skip, he's not afraid to call Rhea out on her misdeeds, but she she keeps shooting it down at every turn, which is a shame as Crimson Flower could have otherwise been avoided. Those who rule this world use that beast's power to fabricate miracles, all to control those who blindly believe in the goddess. They conceal the truth and force their lies on the nobility. They mercilessly annihilate anyone who defies them. He's got a point, Walt. So does my knee. Ooh! When Sephiroth could spare the time to chat with the class, it's here where I witnessed him to be a beacon of prudence and leadership, due to his willingness to resonate with others and offer the best advice possible. From expressing how Felix must look beyond his preferences and embrace those who think differently, reassuring Ingrid that her crest does not dictate her value, not so subtly hinting that Hilda needs to stop being so lazy, that eventually blossoms into a story of life lessons and a sweet friendship. Bonding over fishing with Leone and how the same activity is done for different purposes, and finally being able to trust Byleth all the while revealing bits and pieces of their backstory. Thanks to such spectacular script writing, Seven feels like a very three-dimensional character to me, that while certainly flawed, makes the best use of every situation and is a very grounded and relatable individual. Plus, I love his relationship with Flame, but not because over time he learns to ease up and let her go, and she too understands his need to keep her safe, but because of the face he pulls at the end of their sea support. That is the look of a man whose entire world has come crashing down. Imagine if you received some actual shocking news regarding Sethleen. <sighs> father? Father? Oh, there you are, Father! Thank the heavens! I have been searching high and low for you! I come bearing such wondrous news! Please, Flame, remain calm. I apologize for being absent for so long. There were matters I had to attend to. Now, my dear, what new information has brought you so much joy all of a sudden? I'm pregnant! Saint Chico didn't become Rhea's right-hand man just through his dialect, as the dude's got the power to sustain his standing. In fact, Sephiroth might just be one of the best units in all of Foldland, and no wonder as to why himself and Seros won the War of Heroes. Debuting at level 23 as a wooden rider, Sephiroth accumulates excellent base stats, having high numbers in everything that isn't luck and rest. Heck, even his magic is good, and despite being a pre-promote, his growths are impressive as the lowest he'll go is 25%, allowing him to start strong and possibly surpass the entire faculty. His caps are nicely spread out and don't drop below 40, while ushering in 5 positive learning fields and only lacking in riding, with many abilities already unlocked like high level prowess skills, riot defense, axe fair, as well as his perk of granting plus 3 extra damage to female allies, just in case it wasn't clear that he looks out for this little lady. Adding to this esteemed resume, Sever pertains 5 exclusive authority abilities, having 2 running skills, as well as Battalion Wrath and Desperation, which when paired with Vantage, will allow him to show these sinners no quarter, not to mention his 5 exclusive arts too, in particular Swift Strike, which many consider the best attack in the game. Plus he bears the major crest of Cheek Hole, and for a physical fighter, his reason pool is actually really impressive, while Faith is rather fleeting, with the lack of a budding talent being his only major blemish. In summary, Sephiroth I would define as a very potent and vastly versatile unit that basically functions like Camilla, 
Come to think of it, they both hold high positions of power, have dragon blood, start as wyverns, can run a mixed build, and simultaneously dote on and worry about their loved ones with similarly swirly hair and the ability Lily's Poise. I think I might be onto something. If you wish to try something a little different, then Axe and Lance based classes are to me the ideal choices. Though the latter, barring Wyvern Lord, will require riding, so be prepared to go into overtime, and backpedaling to Brigid in order to obtain Death Blow speaks for itself. With Warrior granting him extra axe crit, and though Paladin may take a while, it does grant him an excellent defensive skill. Warmaster focuses on pure power, and by extension Swordblade classes maximizes DPS. And since he's already got axes down pat, Hero is the most promising proposition. But be sure to not let Swordmaster and Assassin pass you by. Plus, Mortal Savin 2 bearing in mind Seth's impressive reason pool. Following up on this concept, mixed magic classes like Dark Knight can be potentially exceptional, though Darkfly is unfortunately not accessible since Flame Cool Dibs. But fear not, as Warlock is another option, as well as Dark Bishop for these two beauties. Faith oriented occupations, I contend to be a fruitless endeavour and a waste of his skills, minus maybe Holy Knight and War Monk. And speaking of such, attributes that improve his res, like Tone Breaker and Warding Blow, or instead increases attack power, are in my opinion the best bet. Plus, due to his high HP, going down the Wrath Defiant line can make for risky but extremely potent plays. Also, given his high amount of dexterity, skills that trigger based on said values should activate frequently. In conclusion, Sephiroth is a fantastic unit that can basically fit just about every role you can think of, and this brilliance extends to his biography, as the man excels at pointing his peers in the right direction while trying to bear the weight of the world on his shoulders, and it's easy to see why the Immaculate One trusts him so dearly, and yet not even he can surpass who I feel to be the holiest of Seros' saints. Now before the process of elimination comes into play, I'm sure some of you are wondering about two particular souls I have neglected to mention, that being Rhea and Byleth. Well I'm not counting Rhea since she's not playable, but I will say that I definitely find her to be one of the better Fire Emblem villains, as she's incredibly two-faced, going from a warm, caring, soft and graceful saint, to a malevolent, cruel, stubborn and maniacal monster at the drop of a hat, which to me makes her someone who I want to both protect and destroy depending on her state of being, and the type of character I love and hate equally. Plus, Sharon Lee's performance is the absolute best in this game, she did a phenomenal job. Additionally, because of all that occurred during the War of Heroes, it's easy to see why she would be so controlling and untrusting of mankind, with her revelation by the end of Silver Snow being one of the most beautiful moments in the entire franchise and the one reason that pathway is worth playing as opposed to the thousands of other factors that make me want to skip this shit. When regarding the Enlightened One, I honestly can't evaluate Byleth the same way I can with Robin, Corin, and Chris. Yes, I played Epi-12. To be more specific, while the prior three avatars are meant to be self-inserts for the player to project themselves, 95% of their dialogue, personality traits and responses are predetermined, with only a small number of instances to influence what these surrogates can say and do. Byleth, however, is the complete opposite, as though they only pertain two to three responses at a time, just about every interaction Byleth has allows the player to dictate what the professor will say, and thus we are the ones who determine what kind of personality Byleth has. As such, I don't feel it's fair to judge Byleth in relation to the other characters, since said character is purely the result of the player's actions, and thus it changes in accordance to input. But I will say, while Robin remains my favourite of the bunch, Byleth, I feel, is the best in the context of being a surrogate placeholder, and thankfully not acting as the driving force of the narrative, but rather as one who influences how people move forward in life, and is essential for the four leaders of Folden to complete their character arcs. Plus, as a unit, much like their fellow Blank Slates, Byleth is fantastic, and more than likely the best buster in the game, or at the very least, top 5 material, with the female version being superior due to the class exclusivity that she sustained. And speaking of fantastic feminine fighters... <laughs> Shamir Neverend. Due to the game's design philosophy, Fire Emblem Free Houses accumulates extensive variables that change upon each playthrough, but the one thing that remained consistent across all my save files was ensuring that Shamir was a member of my team and being one of the best units to boot. Plus, I make sure Dorothea, Mariana, and Mercedes are always on my side. I could never bring myself to end the life of my waifus. Getting back on point, Shamir is by far the coolest character Fire Emblem has ever created, and easily my favourite Knight of Seros, thanks to not only acting as the neutral party and moral stronghold in a game where beliefs and ideals often cloud judgement, but furthermore how she's able to educate many underlings about important life lessons and have her own personal journey. Helps by the fact that even with over 15 games prior, Shamir was able to rise to the top of the bow based tier list and remain a magnificent mercenary at all times. I hope that Rhea paid you well Shamir, because you'll always get top billing in my book. Hailing from the land of Dagda, Shamir has had it rough ever since her homeland and Bridget tried to invade the Empire, only for both nations to fail and result in the death of her lover. 
at which point Shamir became a mercenary for hire and worked within the Church of Seros. But unlike her relic wielding confederate, Miss Neverend is not loyal to Rhea or a believer of the faith. Instead, she makes her way through life without forming attachments and not letting emotions get in the way of her duties. What I feel sets Shamir apart is how juxtaposed she is with masses of loyalty and belief driven faces for our Fodland, as this sensational sniper takes a neutral stance to all situations, being analytical as opposed to affectionate and not one for small talk preferring not to dwell on the past as she prioritises the present. And it's from my perspective one of the most down-to-earth and relatable characters in a game filled with some of the most contemporary faces in the entire franchise. Man, I would love to see how she would react to something as ridiculous as Fire Emblem Fates. For justice! Oh no, I'm hungry. Smile! You're dead. You're gonna need stitches! Ugh, my aching blood! Stiff, 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 stiff upper lip. I'll play with you. <gasps> Did I do that? Here on fire! Death comes for everyone. I'm helping. We got trouble. I'm surrounded by idiots. Thanks to her attitude, there's nothing fake or forced about Shamir's persona, and this woman's life experience solidifies her authenticity, much of which is expressed through her support, as Shamir sets a shining example for the students to follow, such as instructing Raphael how to focus more on stealth, expressing the importance of visiting places firsthand with Ignatz, teaching Leone to incorporate her training into part of her daily routine, as well as helping Cyril to become an outstanding archer. It's not all business with this Dagden, as Shamir has personal stakes in some matters as well as her own revelations regarding her future. As though herself and Petra share a mutual history against the Empire, they don't let it interfere with their friendship, and the princess is able to convince Shamir to choose her loved ones over her homeland. With Caspar feeling guilty that it was his father who took the lives of many Dagdens, but Shamir does not blame him for his ancestors' actions, and teaches him the importance of not throwing his life away for the sake of regret. Herself and Dudu, while having many similarities, still share their fair set of differences which both separate and bind them together. Plus, when chilling with Catherine, they have a very back and forth banter, hoping that the future will allow them to stay friends forever. Not to mention getting over the loss of her first love thanks to Byleth. And this kind of character growth is something I find refreshing considering her designation as a mentor, skills and experience, with the latter department being Shamir's forte. Shamir may not be tied to the church, but that doesn't stop her from carrying out her missions with the utmost diligence, as she might just be one of the best units in Free Houses and Bow Bearers in the entire series. Shamir partners up with Byleth during Chapter 6, and right off the boat, has bases similar to Catherine's, with everything minus magic and res being in the double digits and over 20 dexterity, making her a strong physical fighter, with Gross favouring a glass cannon build, which applies to her max stats, favouring strength, dexterity and speed, but failing at res, magic and defence, that may result in her being surpassed by the likes of Claude, Leonie and Bernadetta in regards to archery. Speaking of which, Shamir works as a sniper and is built to perfect the profession, as she ascertains an A rank in bows alongside close counter, bow fair and bow range plus one. Plus by mastering her line of work, she can unlock Hunter's Volley and clock out early, along with a C plus rank in lances, favouring the prior fills with Faith functioning as her only shortcoming. She's also got three prowess skills and four exclusive combat arts, with Lance Jab being her final trump card, and though she possesses no crest nor budding talent, she makes personal skills identical to Perry's bloodlust, and thus stick your dancer to this dag den like super glue in order for her to get the job done before her lunch is over. Since she put so much stock in her bow proficiency, I noticed many players upgrading Shamir to the status of Bow Knight, and personally speaking, I find it to work great. Plus, in the downtime, purchasing Paladin can increase her movement, as well as grant her Aegis to mitigate her lack of resilience. Barring bows, lance-based affiliations work well too, so Pegasus Knight and by extension Wyvern Lord basically make her Claw 2.0. And though Great Knight helps for a bow, it's a contract I personally wouldn't sign. And Sword Classes I cement is okay given her glass cannon nature, with Assassin being a no-brainer. Shamir can certainly to use axes and gauntlets, but I personally discern her to function better at a distance. And when magic is concerned, her recent spell pool does have its perks, and despite lacking in faith, she can learn physic, which is actually pretty nice. So if she has to become a sorceress, going Dark Knight I'd argue to be her best option, with Dark Flyer, Valkyrie and Mortal Seven also acting as worthwhile investments. Though I personally would not recommend Grimmery or anything faith focused. And though a bit of a hassle, maxing out Major Fiendish Blow goes about saying. When expanding her skill set, abilities that either increase her bulk or allow Shamir to fight with many safety nets, I find to be tremendously tantalizing, such as the blow skills for stat boost, Aegis and Provice, Stealth to avoid detection, Lethality, which when considering her dexterity will become a second nature, and though a highly obtuse tactic, having Transmute, getting attacked by and then killing a mage will grant her plus 7 to Strength, Magic, Dex and Speed, and make for a very good payday. When taking all the variables into account, Shamir is relatively versatile and I believe to excel in an assortment of careers, and while she may fall slightly behind the highest ranking recruits, this consultant fits the role of my favourite Knight of Seros to the latter. 
True, she's not the best unit or most complex line of code contained within this cartridge, but so much about Shimiri is undeniably cool and the way she's able to balance wisdom and realism with her ambition and solidarity makes her someone so unique to this universe all the while battling her own demons and desires, with supports that hit very close to home the same way she'll never miss a shot and in the end struck me right in the heart and claimed it as her own once the war was over, which is why she takes the number one spot as my favourite Knight of Seros in Fire Emblem Free Houses. This has been Blazing Knight. I wish you all a great night, take care, and while it's easy to overlook the nights when so much of our time is dedicated to scrutinising the students, these disciples further cement this game as my favourite in the entire franchise, but before we get around to honouring the Golden Deer, I'll be heading down into the depths of the Abyss, where the Ashen Wolves prepare to make themselves known throughout all of Foldland. Thank you all for watching today, I hope you had a great time and enjoyed the video. Please let me know what you thought in the comments, and what are some of your favourite Knights of Seros and Fire Emblem Free Houses, I'd be delighted to know. Also I want to say an especially big thank you to all the voice actors who helped make this video possible. You all did a fantastic job, you are absolutely fantastic. So a big thank you to Chris Digital Dreams, Com Rio, Dumb Goff Peach, Ephemeral Blitz, Gamer Maniac, Insane Nore, Joey Pals, Moon Angel Fire, Mystic Blue, and Shadow Ryuga. Each and every one of you are absolutely fantastic. Thanks a million once again. Please be sure to give this video a like and subscribe as it helps out the channel immensely. And don't forget to follow me on other platforms such as Twitter, Discord, and Mino, Twitch where I live stream five times a week, as well as Patreon to help support this channel and receive some additional bonuses. And of course, I'd like to say the absolute biggest thank you to all my patrons who help support this channel and make these videos possible. Man, it's... Sorry this one took so long, you'll know what I had to go over here in the server, but thank you all so much for just all that love, support and help, just so I can be really ambitious with these videos, try new things, and just that you are there to help and encourage me on, just give me feedback and everything, it just means the world to me, I'm so, so grateful to all of you, you mean everything to me, I love you, I love you, I love you all so, so, so much, you're the, oh god, I love you, I seriously, seriously love all of you. And I'd like to say a very special thank you to Shadow Dragon, Wolf Fox, Lucina21, Levy94, K Dog, Degenerate Peach, Chaos Sableye, Vincent Clark, Midnight Castle, Maggie Fall, Jeremy Redinger, Baronin8392, Daniel Hodgson, Twisted Scarecrow, and finally Foretto. Thank you all so much. You people are just the best. I love each and every one of you. Thank you. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll see you all next time.